Okay. So, okay. Thank you. It looks like we're ready to roll. So, at 15 years old, I was having so many problems with my parents. I mean, they were, the unreasonableness about drove me crazy. Curfews, can't drive the car without a parent in it. Bedtimes, can't date till you're 16. Regular meal times, have to check in. It was driving me crazy. So they decided the best thing to do would be to send me up to my granddad's farm in central Utah because my dad believed there is no ill that can't be handled by spending a little bit of time on the farm. So I went up with granddad and we walked the fields, we gathered eggs, he, we rode in his, uh, his old, real old um, red Ford pickup it was just a it was just a glorious time and and as we talked he told stories and he was telling stories one day as we came across the outhouse um and I, so i opened the door i i just wanted to see what was in there and there were three holes in the outhouse so my granddad explained to me that everybody back in the day before um before indoor plumbing had at least one hole in the outhouse. I mean, you had to have an outhouse and it had to have at least one hole. And that was the general population. And then if you were doing a little bit better, um, things were, were going a little bit better for you, then maybe you would have two holes in your outhouse. My dad's family had three holes. I thought I came from royalty. As I sat at his kitchen table talking with him one day, I was listening to his the stories and the, the stories of, of my family, the stories of the farm, the stories of how they brought water into the, the North Tract, and, and I looked at his hands. He had huge farmer's hands. They were wrinkled, they were ragged, um, they, were, they, were, they were just, they had so much personality in them. And I remember thinking, in those hands, I wish I knew every story that those hands held. And then it dawned on me that when he died, his hands would take those stories with him. My Aunt Ruth, my dad's oldest sister, who just turned 100 in February, decided that she was going to write our family stories. Now, I call it our family stories because it's not really our family history. It's a history of our family. But it's not a history of starting here at this point and then getting to this point and then this point and finally getting to this point. It's stories. And there are there are dates in there, there are names in there, but that's not those aren't the things that I remember about these stories. What I remember about the stories is just the the stories themselves, the people came to life. Well she started writing these stories when she was sixty eight. It took her twenty years to get it done. And at 88, she gathered up her manuscript and took it into a publisher and said, I want to publish my book. And so he read it through and he said, Ruth, you got to change some stuff in here. There's some pretty antiquated language. Um, some of the stuff is kind of, I, I think you just it just needs to be edited. It needs to be changed. And she said, I ain't going to change it. And he said, yeah, but if you're going to publish it, we really got to make a few changes. She said, I'm not going to change it. And if you don't want to publish it, I will find somebody else. To publish it and she gathered up her stuff and she walked out and he uh, this the story that she told me is that he followed her out and he said fine fine we'll leave it the way it is we'll publish it the way that you want it published and so she published it and I am so glad that she stuck to her guns I'm so glad that she did not let this person who didn't know anything about our family change the way that she told those stories because when I read them I hear her voice it's almost as though she's sitting next to me telling me these stories and I I love them. Back when I was 15, I decided I was going to be a storyteller. I come from a long line of storytellers. Some of them some of them stick to the actual stuff that happened in those stories. Some of them the stories get better and bigger with age. And I enjoy both kind. But I decided that I was going to be a storyteller. A few years ago, I decided that I wanted to teach people how to write their stories. Not to write their history, their personal history, because that, to me that sounds just daunting. Now if you're 20 years old, 
that's not such a daunting task because your personal history is only like 20 years old. But if you are no longer a great risk for a 30-year mortgage, then your personal history is going to be pretty daunting because you got a lot of years to make up there. So I decided that I would teach people how to write their history by writing their stories so that they could leave a legacy. So the first thing that you have to do is decide why you're going to do this. If you're going to do this because you want to be remembered or you want to be known, that's a really good reason. That's probably the best reason for writing those stories. If you want to write them because it's your new favorite hobby, that's a great reason to write those stories. If you want to write them because you feel like you should, uh, that's an okay reason, but my personal feeling is that we just end up shooting all over ourselves way too often. So first find your why. Why would you want to write these stories? Why do you want to write them down? Then you got to find your who. Who are you going to write them to? Now when I sit down to write, if I'm writing to somebody, if I'm not writing, if I'm just writing, it's so hard sometimes to come up with an idea and to get the, the words to flow and the words to come out of my fingers onto my keyboard. But if I can start that with just mentally thinking, dear Becky, dear Donna, or something, then I am actually talking to someone. I'm sharing something with someone and it's so much easier for me to write. So my next suggestion is to find your who. Who are you writing this for? Because you're not writing it for yourself. You already lived it. You already know the stories. So who are you writing it for? My who is my great great granddaughter Lucy who I will never meet in this life and she will never meet me in this life and chances are she will never meet anybody who knew me in this life or who remembered me in this life now Lucy is tall she has long dark curly hair she has beautiful blue eyes she's strong-willed she's hard-headed she's softer in the inside than she wants anybody to know that she is and she has had struggles with her uh, unreasonable parents as well so when I'm writing these stories I picture Lucy what do I want her um, to know well I don't necessarily want her to know the travel log of my life and that's what I call the you know I was born on this date and then I started kindergarten here I started then I got to first grade and then by second grade I did this and then by third grade and by the time I'm in fourth grade she would be sound asleep because it would just kind of be a travel log now that is better than not writing anything at all please don't get me wrong with that but I want her to know me I I read this book that my son gave me that I, I really liked it was about a, a, a guy who passed away and the person who wrote his biography didn't meet him in his life and he said it occurs to me as I write this that the forward to this book might be better thought of as an afterword because when it comes to this man all sense of time is turned on its head to begin with or maybe to end with I got to know him only after his death I came to know him most in intimately when he ceased to be that's what I'm hoping Lucy feels when she reads these stories. So where do you start? That's always, always kind of the first question. I don't know where to start. So my suggestion is that you start with a story that you remember. It might be something that happened yesterday. It might be something that happened a week ago. It might have been that Christmas um, 50 years ago that you remember something happening. You write that story down. Don't get all tangled up with um, punctuation, spelling, grammar. Um, you're not going to turn this into your English teacher for a grade and chances are your posterity <coughs> isn't going to grade you on those edits either. You can edit them later. But just get the story written down. Talk about how you felt. Talk about how you, what you were going through. Most of the stories that you're going to think about are going to be not when your life was going in a straight line. It's going to be when it just took a real fast right turn or a real quick left turn or maybe a u-turn it's it's the zigs and the zags it's the it's the curves it's the times when you ran off into a ditch or you hit the tree or you ran into the block wall 
or you lost your dentures in the middle of giving a talk. It's just going to be when there's a, when there's a zig and a zag. That's what makes life very, very interesting. Today, we are living through probably, in my lifetime, the biggest zig and zag that, that I've ever lived through. This is crazy times. It's, it's, it's unprecedented. And so this is a great time to start writing those stories. How do you feel about this? Now, you don't have to worry about all of the, the names, the dates, you know, the exact date that the shutdown happened or the exact date that this happened. They will be able to Google this or whatever they're going to call it 100 years from now. They can get those details. Um, those are kind of like brain details. What they want to know is how you handled this. In May, April and May of this year, I was able to interview about 60 graduating seniors and I was so curious to hear their take on this because what I had heard from parents and grandparents was how how um, horrible they felt that these kids wouldn't get to go to prom and that they wouldn't get to play their spring sports or have their spring orchestra, band concerts, choir concerts, how they wouldn't be able to to walk for their graduation and they were just feeling so terrible for these kids. I was interested to hear what the kids felt about this. And almost without fail, maybe only one or two were different than this. They said something like, well, yeah, it stinks. I mean, it stinks that we didn't get to have our prom and it stinks that I didn't get to go to state with baseball or whatever it was. And then they said this, but our graduation is gonna be different than anybody's graduation ever. I'm so excited. And I said, what about after graduation? How do you feel about things? Because the world is a little nuts right now. And they said, well, yeah, but I'm so excited. I can't wait to see where I go next. This was almost 60 graduating seniors talking about this stuff. So I talked to them and I said, write this stuff down. Write how you felt. Write about those days that, that you were missing your friends or the day that it dawned on you that everything had changed. Um, you think you're going to remember this because your brain is pretty young right now, but I promise you at some point you're not going to remember as intimately those feelings as you remember right now. So write them down. And, and it was interesting to hear how many of them were planning to do just that. So I decided that I probably should do the same thing for Lucy. She's going to read about this time. She's going to read about this pandemic, this shutdown, these uh, lockdowns, these all the things that are going on in the world. But I want her to know how it affected me. Um, nobody's story, no two stories are going to be alike because this is life through my eyes. My sister going through the exact same thing, her story will look a little bit different than mine because that's life through her eyes and that's okay. That's all right. It doesn't mean that hers is right and mine's wrong or mine's right and <coughs> hers is wrong. It just means that we're two different people viewing life through two different sets of eyes. So this is what I wrote in a journal entry um, that I, that I want to pass on in my life stories to Lucy. This morning I awoke to the words of the beautiful hymn, Master the Tempest is Raging, playing over and over in my mind. Master, the tempest is raging, the billows are tossing high. The sky is o'ershadowed with blackness, no shelter or help is nigh. Over and over again in my head. And this is what I wrote. In my 62 years of life, I have experienced many physical, mental, and spiritual tempests. I have witnessed tempests played out in the streets, at schools and universities, and through wars fought around the world, but I have never witnessed them come together in such a perfect storm as I am witnessing today. I hold to my faith and cling to my testimony as I cry, Master, the tempest is raging, and pray to hear his words, peace, be still. I join my voice in prayer with millions across the globe, praying for an end to this madness. I heeded a prophet's call when the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints
President Russell M. Nelson called for a worldwide fast on April 10th, Good Friday, that the present pandemic may be controlled, caregivers protected, the economy strengthened, and life normalized. As I did, I pled for miracles that the world could see. I wanted to awaken on April 11th to the news that things we fasted and prayed for had come to fruition, that life would be restored to what we knew before anyone had ever heard of COVID-19. But it didn't happen that way. The tempest raged on and seemed to have gained strength since the day of the worldwide fast. Pope Francis joined with Muslim leaders in calling for a world day of prayer to end the coronavirus. He called on the believers of all the religions to unite together spiritually on May 14th in a day of prayer and fasting to implore God to help humanity overcome the coronavirus pandemic. Again, I joined brothers and sisters across the world as we heeded the call. Again, I hoped to awaken on May 15th to a miracle of biblical proportions. And still, the tempest raged on. I used that in a post that I <clears throat> put on this group and on a, a few other groups that got a lot of response. Um, it was very heartwarming to hear people talk about their, uh, their thoughts on the same thing. I think a lot of us really kind of hoped for a parting of the Red Sea, and the Red Sea hasn't parted yet. But there are miracles out there um, that, we can, that we can see if we look for them. The tempest is definitely raging. Um, a few years ago, several years ago, my husband and I took a trip up the west coast and I for the first time got to see uh, an actual lighthouse. The first thing that, that I thought was just how massive it was. I mean, it was, it was huge and it was so tall. And then when we looked around the front and saw that light, it was, it was huge. And I mean, I'd never seen anything like it. And what was explained to me was that beam from up on top, way up high, shines way out over the, over the ocean, over the sea, to help those who are, are on boats and ships be able to guide them toward the harbors that they're coming to. But there comes a point in that journey where the beam is shining high and they are actually traveling below that huge beam toward the harbor and that's usually um, the most treacherous or most tricky part of their trick or their trip because um, because of the narrowness of the channel maybe it's rocky um, maybe it's a little bit more uh, shallow and so right around the bottom toward the bottom of the um, of the lighthouse are lights the lower lights and those lower lights are every bit as important as the huge beam at the top because those lower lights help guide the captain of those ships and of those boats safely into the harbor help them be able to navigate those narrow passageways um, there's a hymn in the that that I absolutely love that talks about those lower lights and um, and what it's all about and what and what it means what it means for us brightly beams our father's mercy from his lighthouse evermore but to us he gives the keeping of the lights along the shore dark the night of sin has settled now the angry billows roar eager eyes are watching For the lights along the shore, let 
stories, you allowing me into some of your most intimate thoughts and situations, asking for prayers, asking for comfort, and allowing me to do the same. It seems that through this whole pandemic and process, they don't want us to gather. They don't want us. We, we gain strength when we gather. And so we physically can't gather in most places right now. But this group has given us a place to gather and to teach one another and to share with one another. We are the lower lights. You are my lower lights and I am so grateful to each one of you. Your stories as you share them with your who become their lower lights. When I was 28 years old, I was widowed, and I was left with a three-year-old son and a one-year-old baby. In the blink of an eye, my world got tipped upside down, and I did not know how I was going to get through it. I spent hours on my knees. I had days when, if I could get one foot in front of the other, I felt like I had accomplished a, a great deal, and sometimes that's how we all feel about different things that we're that we're going through sometimes it's just putting one foot in front of the other to be honest with you sometimes um, I would like to just sit in the corner and suck my thumb for a while or crawl back in bed and cover up my head and just not come out but as I went through my uh, very young widowhood I wrote some of those stories down Will Lucy be widowed at a young age? I don't know. Will she lose a child? I don't know. Will she suffer depression? I don't know. Will she end up divorcing or maybe not marrying or not being able to have children or whatever might come her way? Will she, will she experience those things? I don't know which ones she'll experience, but she'll experience some. It's just a guarantee here. And so maybe through reading my story and how I felt when I went through that, not not like the clinical stuff, but how I actually felt, 
and and the days where I just felt like I, I didn't want to open the blinds, I didn't want to get out of bed. Thank goodness I had two little boys who I, I had to get out of bed. But hopefully as she reads those stories, that will help guide her to know that she's going to be okay, that it is going to get better. You know, if great grandma bubbles from way back when um, could get through it, then certainly I can get through it, right? And so that's that's the importance, really, that's the importance of those stories. We have to, um, we just have to not give up. I mean, suck your thumb for a little while, but then just get up and and keep on moving. There is a great reward for us if we just keep putting one foot in front of the other. I, I believe that with all of my heart. And that no, not only is that reward in the next life, but I believe that there is great reward here as we put one foot in front of the other and help others and help ourselves. Let us all press on in the work of the Lord that when life is o'er we may gain a reward in the fight for right. Let us win a sword, the mighty sword of truth. We will not retreat, though our numbers may be few when compared with the opposite most in view, but an unseen power will aid me and you in the glorious cause of truth. Be not though the enemy deride, courage for the Lord is on our side. We will heed not what the wicked may say, but the Lord alone we will obey. Prosper the cause of truth. Fear not, though the enemy deride. Courage for the Lord is on our side. We will heed not what the wicked may say, but the Lord alone we will obey. But the Lord alone we will obey. Um, in 1874, Marianne Baker wrote that hymn, Master of the Tempest is Raging. And I, mean, I love the hymn. And if I hadn't read why she wrote it, I would have just thought, wow, this gal has got faith that probably never, never ever failed. She had such a story to tell. But she lived a very, very, very turbulent life. Her mother and father both died of tuberculosis, leaving her and her sister and her brother orphans. Shortly after that, her brother contracted the same disease, and so Marianne and her sister scraped together every penny they could find, every, every last penny that they could find so that they could send him to Florida for treatment. It wasn't long after he arrived in Florida that he died. They had no money. Marianne and her sister had no money left. They couldn't bring his body back to Chicago for a decent burial. She said, um, she explained that she became rebellious, believing God didn't care for her. But the Master's own voice stilled the tempest in my unsanctified heart and brought it to the calm of a deeper faith and a more perfect trust. I'm so glad that she, that she wrote that because I know a little bit more about the hymn now. It means a little bit more to me than it did before, and it's because she wrote the story of why she wrote it. It is my hope and my desire that each one of you will continue to write. You, you have written some beautiful things on this group. You have shared some, some um, glorious things so eloquently and so simply. 
at the same time. I, I would suggest that you print these, these um, posts, that you print them and you put them in a book somewhere or you copy them in a journal. These things are something that your Lucy is going to need to read. She's going to need to know about your struggles. She's going to need to know that it's okay to reach out to ask others for prayers and for help, even to people that you have never met and may never meet in this lifetime. She is going to need to know that that is okay. The end of my of my journal entry, my story that I'm writing for Lucy goes like this. I yearn for the day the Master will raise his hands and command the earth and its inhabitants with the words, Peace, be still. I know that day will come, but I don't know when, so I seek for peace in my soul. I cannot control the violence, the corruption, the chaos, the fear, the anxiety playing out across cities, counties, states, and nations. My puny arms aren't strong enough to lift the world from its ills, but my knees are sturdy enough to kneel, my voice is strong enough to pray, and my faith is steady enough to believe he will send peace to my soul in the midst of this storm. And that's what I hope for each of us, that we can find that peace in the midst of the storm. It may it may, the, the tempest may continue for a very long time, but I hope and pray that as we shine our lights and keep those lower lights burning, that we can find comfort, that we can find peace, that we can continue to gather together and that more will join us in this, uh, in this wonderful endeavor. I'm grateful to have been here with you tonight. I'm Charlene Paul. My passion is stories, personal stories. Please take the time to write yours down. Somewhere in the eternities, someone needs to know who you are. Thank you. Now you'll be able to choose if you want.